so uh, hi everybody, <laughs> welcome to the day. Uh, I have no idea what I'm billed as talking about, but I changed my mind about 20 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, today I'm going to talk about something that, of course, I have um, you know, no, no right to talk about other than making huge generalizations, which is blockchains and the Scandinavian social contract. Um, so I'm going to try and outline what it looks like if you think about a political philosophy of the blockchain coming from a kind of democratic socialist perspective rather than from an American libertarian perspective. So what I'm basically going to try and do here is split apart the kind of historical cultural ideology of the blockchain and see what happens if we imagine that you know Satoshi had been a Scandinavian socialist of the kind of mid-left <laughs> range. Uh, because I think this is quite a useful way of understanding what the technology is to separate it from its normative political context and put it into a new political context and see what changes and what stays the same. So the normal thing that is stressed when people discuss blockchains is that blockchains provide private transactions. And everybody says privacy, 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 privacy. Of course, this is not remotely true. Right? What blockchains provide is anonymous transactions. So the transactions themselves are fully public, and the blockchain cannot function without fully public transactions at the current level of technology. There are ex you know, extremely esoteric math uh, solutions which might provide for um, blockchains which are both integrity and anonymity, or where you could, for example, not see the amount of the transactions. But all of the existing generation of blockchain check, it's very simple. Uh, the thing works because it is completely transparent. All of the transactions are visible at all times. Right? There is no privacy. What there is is secrecy and anonymity. And the secrecy is who owns which account. And that model has been you know, lauded and stabilized, but it really doesn't work in practice because of traffic analysis. Right? Because you can see all of the transactions in the system, in all probability, if you put some effort into it, you can figure out from a pattern of transactions who a specific account belongs to, at which point what you actually have in the blockchain system is a completely transparent corner of the financial system. And the notion of a completely transparent kind of finance is something that you can see has all kinds of interesting implications when you have a social contract in which transparency uh, for the people but also for the state is an acceptable outcome. So the first thing that I would suggest is that had Satoshi been a uh, you know, Norwegian communist, <laughs> <laughs> had it been an extension of the shelfare state, then you could easily imagine a situation in which the transparency of the system would have been stressed at its core. Right? This is a level playing field for all citizens and for the state. You can see exactly where every penny of your tax dollar goes. You can see what we spend it on, we can see what you spend it on, and because we are all in this together, this works because it allows you to identify places where people are freeloading or where the government is spending money in inefficient ways. Same technology, but now it's a transparent society. And you're already f more or less cashless. Right? I mean, hands up if you're not carrying any cash at all in your pockets. Right? Amazing. Right? Amazing. <laughs> so you have a cashless society with full transparency all the way through every tier of the society makes tax enforcement extremely simple. Right? If you see people with physical assets that weren't paid for using the national blockchain standard, you could ask questions about whether they have other sources of money. Are they trading in commodities through some bank account? You know, what, how are they doing this? What would change in your society if you had that kind of transparency? Would it make a fundamental break with the current status quo? Or would it be an extension of the current social contract onto a new technology platform tightening up the arrangements and making it easier to understand the function. What do you think? Any opinions? Everything would stay the same, show of hands? Something would radically break? Nobody really knows. <laughs> so, you know, a few hands either way, no strong opinions in the middle. Right. So that to me suggests that there's a meaningful and worthwhile experiment to see what happens if you take an already transparent society with a very strong collective social contract and add technology which makes it fully transparent. Now, is there any need to change the underlying blockchain technology to make that happen? No. You simply need to make sure that all of the accounts are registered before they're permitted to trade. 
which is probably 50 lines of code inside of any of the major systems. Mm -hmm. You need something which issues IDs to citizens, but you probably already have almost all of that infrastructure for PKI, um, used for digital signing of documents or access mm -hmm. to bank accounts. So with only very small changes to the fundamental technologies, you can bring a transparent society. Right? Perhaps you could also build on top of that for things like voting. Right. You might need an anonymity layer in addition to, but if everybody receives a token in their digital wallet, which allows them to make one vote, and then you go through some kind of binding process like the old show me and digital cash stuff, you get anonymous voting out of the same basic transactional engines. Now, what kinds of changes would you see in society as a result of full transparency? Right. Certainly there would be reduced fraud, certainly there would be reduced waste, you might get a much sharper discussion about in economic inequality once you can see what the rich are spending their money on. Mm. Right. <laughs> but within this context, right, within the social contract that you have here, these things are imaginable without looking revolutionary. Right? It's an incremental step. It's one of the potential ways that the technology could integrate <coughs> into this society. Now, I want you to do a thought experiment and I want you to pretend that you're American libertarians from the <laughs> desert areas of the US, right? Perhaps Montana, you know, Arizona, Utah. How does this sound? So what we're going to have is we're going to make sure that there's no cash anywhere in the system. The government is going to know what you spend every single penny that you spend on. All of your taxes are going to be visible all the way through the government, but we're not going to let that happen to the black budget because we don't really want people knowing what we're spending $60 billion a year on. And that's only the visible part of the black budget. Nobody knows how big the invisible part is. And you know, as a result of this, we're going to have a fairer and more efficiently collectivist society. Right? It sounds like an invasion from space. <laughs> right? yeah. you know, it's exactly the kind of thing that these people would fight to the death to avoid happening to them. And they don't mean their death, they mean yours. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the difference between these two scenarios? Right? Same technology. The only question is whether the accounts are registered or unregistered. In one society, it's a small incremental innovation. In another society, it means burning the society down from scratch and looks like an invasion from Mars. Right? What this tells me is that we don't really have a terribly clear understanding of the social contracts around technology. So these technologies come over the horizon. And because computer scientists are typically not trained to think politically, even though they have enormous political power, you tend not to get proper analysis of what's happening until the technology hits civil society. And civil society lacks the fine manipulators to understand the difference between an anonymous system, a private system, and a secret system. And when you say, well, it's all a question of whether you know who owns the accounts, the idea that that's a digital signature with a tax ID number on it and it could be done for $100,000 for a nation is completely lost to them. Right? So what we wind up with is this very, very, very loose, sloppy discourse around the political impact of technology because nobody has the right combination of skills to get that analysis right. And there is a kind of folklore inside of computer science about politics that basically has two camps, right? There are anarchists, typically of a kind of Stallman-esque variety, um, who believe in sharing, they believe in cooperation, they believe in openness of ideas, they believe in copyleft, uh, and there are libertarians who, as far as I can tell, split into half a dozen different factions, all of which revolve around this idea of personal autonomy and freedom as tools that you could construct a society from, which is kind of an unproven hypothesis. Mm. Uh, you could certainly get a market that way, but as I say, free people make free markets, free markets do not necessarily make free people. Yes? There's a third scenario, and that is countries where they have a totalitarian regime, like in China. Oh, yeah. They have this Facebook thingy, which you have to be in. Right? Yes, Sesame Credit. And this kind of surveillance <coughs> is not really good. So this kind of um, openness could not necessarily benefit all scenarios. I think that third scenario is also very important. Mm. Yes, absolutely. Does everybody know about Sesame Credit? So the basic idea is that you have a kind of credit rating for your standing as a Chinese citizen. And if you're hanging out with a bunch of friends and keep buying foreign books from Amazon that are about dangerous subjects, your credit <laughs> rating goes down just for knowing these people. <laughs> and you know, this sounds kind of you know, like, what? And no, this is actually a real thing. 
right? It's in the early stages of adoption and implementation, but the Chinese government are perfectly serious about you know, causing social change using you know, credit rating and social network analysis. It's an amazing concept. Not necessarily a friendly one, but an amazing one. <laughs> on the other hand, you know, when you consider that one-seventh of Americans are on food stamps, right? so they need money from the government in order to eat, and they're only allowed to spend that money on food, and that's a seventh of your population, you, know, you have to say, well, yeah, but you know, exactly who's in a position to throw stones? So I want to go back to this question of what is the framework for analysis? Right? We take a simple technical change, which is whether you register the accounts, and you get two different scenarios, a transparent society or a, a secret society. Right? And one of those is functional inside of a country with a strong social contract. The other makes sense to the radical right in America. Right? And the difference is whether or not you could convene something resembling the functions of a nation state from the technology. So if you have a system with full transparency and taxation is baked into the payment rail, anytime you make a payment, a little smart contract that includes the current version of the tax law runs, your taxes are paid automatically. This flows into government wallets. The government wallets then make the spending, you know, the spending decisions are made, they're logged, the money is spent, you can see your taxes at work. Right. On the other hand, if you have a system which is completely private, you wind up with a technology where you can't collect taxes at all because the citizens' transactions are hidden even from the state. And at that point, you have no ability to convene a state. What happens if you imagine a situation where you have anonymity, but the software for tax continues to run? So that you're only allowed to use a single blockchain, you're private within that blockchain, but the blockchain automatically collects, say, sales tax on payments. Now we have something which is unlike any current functioning political system in that you have absolute personal privacy and potentially a strong state, maybe even a strong welfare state. Mm. And this is why I think it's important for us to learn to think about these technologies not just as market instruments, but as political instruments. Because they take us into a sphere of political possibility where things which have never existed before and are unimaginable begin to be imaginable. And we lack almost any tools for having reasonable political discourse about this. <laughs> Because we're still in a position where 95% of our political discourse is inside of a left-right axis, which goes back to the French Revolution and then Marx. Our entire discourse about political technology is basically within the spectrum of left and right. And left and right are ways of dividing up the ownership of the profit from factories. Industrial production produces a surplus. Does the surplus go to the workers or to the original investors? And that's more or less the entire discourse inside of our societies. What is a unit of collective uh, action is one. The other is who gets the results of factory output. Right now in the UK, manufacturing is 20% of the economy. So we have no effective political discourse about how the profits are divided from the other 80% of the economy. There's just no political there there. There is no map. And you know, when I was doing more political theory, the core conclusion that I came to was that our economic geography is broken. We don't actually have a sensible economic geography. We cannot discuss how value is generated in the global system in any accurate way. Something about complex value networks and jurisdictional arbitrage seems to capture most of it. That's the stuff that isn't in Panama, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bitcoin is global Panama. Panama for the poor man. I don't know. We, we haven't figured out the brand yet. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, um, we also have no sensible political economy. So you can't really understand the influence of money in your societies until you get a really complex, coherent map of the revolving doors in politics where people leave private enterprise, go into government, leave government, go into private enterprise, because that's the majority of the way in which private enterprise controls the state. And that is not just an American phenomenon. That's a form of corruption which is everywhere, because it's very hard to stop people uh, choosing freely what it is they're going to do with their time in a way that binds them from making these kind of dirty deals and then collecting later. A very common pattern. So this is my first thesis, right? That in order to be able to think about the impact of these technologies, because they directly touch money, and money is what society is fundamentally handling in a coercive way, you know, that's the control point for most of us most of the time. It's not law enforcement, it's taxation. 
then we get into the space where almost no discipline exists which can actively, accurately discuss what is happening and what our choices are. And as a result, what we get is a kind of blind stumbling forward into the future without anybody making a choice. And this, to me, is the part where you know, the blockchain question goes from being, wow, this is an interesting new technology, to wow, we're on really thin ice. Mm -hmm. We could see dramatic social change without any real ability to steer, and that change could be in a wide variety of directions, from a kind of Chinese model authoritarian socialism on one end to hardcore American libertarianism on the other, if we're on the left-right axis. But if we then come off plane and go up or down, you know, what happens when you've got you know, anonymous welfare state societies? Unimaginable, is it? Well, you know, the payment system is universally enforced and does taxation, and all the hospitals are free, and so are the schools. You turn up, you know, you're clearly eight years old, you get to come to school for free. We don't care where you came from. Right? <laughs> I mean, you really could imagine something like that emerging. So whose role is it inside of a society to decide what the political impacts of technology will be and who gets to steer? I can tell you exactly whose job that is, but you're not going to be happy afterwards. <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg's. <laughs> <coughs> because in effect, the only actors which have a full grasp of the technology and a full grasp of the politics are a tiny elite of unelected you know, supervillains with <laughs> billions of users under their immediate command who can make policy for a billion people on a whim with no oversight. Right? There's oversight from neither the state nor from the users, so these guys can essentially make law for a billion people anytime they like. Facebook turns around and decides that all of the posts that you've ever made are going to be public right now and anything that contains uh, you know, one of a series of completely illicit words will immediately be forwarded to your mother, there is <laughs> <laughs> there's literally nothing you can do, right? Because it's their data. As soon as you type it into their web form, it's their data. So we're in a position where we have a, you know, technocratic rulers who have enormous reach, and then we have the infamous Satoshi who takes the authority of one of these technocratic rulers, but does it from an anonymous position where he builds code with the impression that he's going to change society in a fundamental way, and then releases it without ever becoming personally identifiable. Right? And you can say that this is a democratic act in that you don't wind up using these technologies unless you choose to. You can also say it's an anti-democratic act because it's ruled by secret leadership. And we lack the political tools to describe what is happening. Even science fiction doesn't really give us the fine nuance that we need to be able to understand what is going on here. So I don't know how we build uh, a good, clear, accurate, sharp understanding of this kind of techno, social, political policy mess, but we need to get one quite quickly because by the end of this year, the sky is going to be on fire. Right? You know, right now, the technologies which are going critical in ways that are completely outside of our understanding uh, Virtual reality, something like five commercial systems come in the market this year, they're all pretty good. Augmented reality, two or three big systems like Microsoft HoloLens, that's probably 15 or 20 billion dollars worth of R&D budget if you take all the systems together. All going on the market now. Anybody got any idea how weird life is going to get when 14 year olds are in VR four hours a day? <laughs> Doing God only knows what in a place that seems completely real? <laughs> You see, but I mean, you know, this is a real thing, right? You can almost see the moral panic headlines right now, and then you think how twisted people are and what they're actually going to do with virtual reality. It's like the moral panic is, if anything, probably underplaying the potential impacts. Right? Um, blockchains, you know, as we all know, they're everywhere. A lot of small country governments are looking at doing crazy innovative things with them. You know, the Estonians will probably wind up running their country on a blockchain in a couple of years. It's a logical extension of where they're at. Uh, artificial intelligence, you know, you've all seen the stuff from DeepMind, you saw them beat Go, uh, you've seen, you know, this stuff that where you take a painting and you take a photograph and then it redoes the photograph in the style of the painting. So you get these fake impressionists or Van Goghs or whatever. If I was an artist, I'd be worrying right now. Because <laughs> you know, it implies that you only need to paint one painting in your entire life and then everything after that you can do digitally. <laughs> really? I mean, you know, uh, smart contracts. Right? Nobody really knows where that's going either, but it, by the time that they're fast enough, you could write algorithms and heuristics in them that are com complex. You could well see 
trading bots that live in a blockchain that continue to trade at an advantage on that blockchain that pay for their own web hosting and if their creator dies they continue to run. Wow. And nobody ever comes to pick up the profit. You know? What if you had those plus artificial intelligence and they wound up out competing humans in the markets? We could literally wind up owned by machines without having to change a single one. <laughs> right. Somebody has to stop this. Or maybe it would turn out to be a more efficient system than what we have today. Right? How do we navigate? Right. Drones, right? Everywhere. We just had the first drone strike incident in London where somebody flew a drone into the path of a plane. Didn't seem to do any damage to the plane, fortunately, but if it had been, you know, half a kilogram of bolts and they managed to hit an engine, you could have downed a plane with that thing. How long before we regulate drones? Household robotics, right? I call my maid once or twice a month less often than I used to because I now have a robot that hoovers. I'm actually causing technological unemployment right now. Mm -hmm. right? And you know, I'm not entirely comfortable with that, but it's really fun to watch the thing run out of batteries, <laughs> right? run off through, all the way through my house, through three different rooms, and plug itself in. <laughs> and it kind of snuggles up to the power stick, and you know, kind of it's nice and close to the connector, and it goes, beep. <laughs> there, there, good boy. <laughs> and then, you know, two hours later, when it's recharged, it runs back through the house to where it had left off, turns on the vacuum, and then finishes the job. Yeah. And that's a consumer device. 20 years from now, the damn thing is going to bring you breakfast in bed. Right. So with all of these technologies going nuclear at the same time, you know, the society that we're in is being changed in ways where nobody has a specialism in understanding and managing that change. And it's not clear where those specialists are going to come from. Medical ethics took a long time to get started as a profession. You could argue that it took 4,500 years for medical ethics to become a thing. Right. And yet medical ethics is at the core of our ability to do scientific research on the human body and how to make it well. Um, but until you've got the ability to run a controlled, style with an e uh, controlled trial with an ethics board overseeing it, if you do those experiments and people die, you're personally responsible. So we're in this position where we have unimaginable technological change in already extremely fragile societies. Everybody knows that our social contracts are under enormous stress. And nobody at the helm other than the people that run big corporations to help us figure out how to make sensible policy around this. And I present this basically in a blockchain context because governance on blockchains is going to become one of the critical questions. Right? What is legal or illegal to do on a blockchain is a question which is becoming really, really, really urgent all over the world right now because we have something that can revolutionarily impact our economies and make them hugely more efficient and transparent, or it could tear our societies to pieces because the governments run out of money and collapse. Did everybody see President Obama's warning about this? Let me see if I can bring up the exact quote. Um, So um, Obama was talking at a digital event in the US called South by Southwest and uh, made some pretty clear comments about how the US government looks at blockchains. If technologically it's possible uh, to make an impenetrable device or system, what mechanisms do we have available that do even simple things like tax enforcement? Because in fact, if you can't crack that at all and government can't get in, then everybody's walking around with a Swiss bank account in their pocket. <laughs> right. Coming from the President of the United States of America. And this is the tax starvation argument that was made by cypherpunks and libertarians in the 1990s. So it's taken 20 years for the tax starvation argument that cryptocurrencies will inevitably cause the collapse of the nation state, which was kind of the philosophy that was behind a lot of this stuff in the 1990s, for that to come out of the mouth of the President of the United States of America. So it's clear that these negotiations have gotten started, right? but who are our negotiators? Who are the policy people that can help us understand, as societies, our existing social contract and the technological possibilities for changes in that, in a manner that isn't simply unelected technical elites making policy for their users, and if they have to muscle it out with the state, they're going to do that. For example, the Uber approach. Right? Uber apparently runs as a non-profit in Norway because they can't legally take money for being the middleman, <laughs> but they're still here. We came by one this morning. 
<laughs> Who is making the decisions? The Norwegian state or a bunch of unelected guys in Silicon Valley? What is the nature of power? So um, now that I've kind of framed that in the abstract, I want to bore down on the smart contract as a particular entity. So I'm from Consensus. I was also the project manager for Ethereum Foundation for the Ethereum release. And you know, I worked as a programmer uh, pretty much until 2010. That's what I did. Uh, two, sorry. 2004, right? So I basically have <laughs> been out of the field for 10 years. Right? I do a little bit of programming here and there around the edges, but I've basically been out for a decade. I look at smart contracts, and what I see are a thing called micro jurisdictions. A smart contract is essentially a tiny little country. And you know, some friends of mine from an outfit called the No Man Group came up with this term, and you know. A micro jurisdiction is a tiny little country that you could send your money to, and it has a set of published law, and as soon as your money is in that country, it's under control of published law, and that published law is the smart contract. Sometimes the smart contract has to make a decision, and it requires an expert witness to come and make uh, a statement of truth. Yes, the temperature is 37 Celsius in Florida, therefore the money will be released. And if you think about the smart contract as a micro jurisdiction, slowly the world is going to go from having 200 places in which you have law, with maybe 1,500 effective jurisdictions, to having 500 million jurisdictions. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of tiny little smart contracts that are a government for seven people. You know, here is the payment that is being controlled, here are the inputs, here are the outputs. Only seven people will ever use that contract, but for those seven people, for that part of their life, that micro jurisdiction makes absolute law. And there is no recourse to a higher jurisdiction if something goes wrong. You might be able to create an insurable risk on top of that, but uh, this, the code of the micro jurisdiction is absolute law. If something goes wrong and your value is lost, maybe you can reclaim for somebody else if you paid for insurance. But if not, the law has spoken and its conclusion is final. So what does it mean that a team of maybe 50 people, the original Ethereum team, could create a platform in which any citizen of the world, which is all of us, has the theoretical possibility of making their own law, and practically speaking, any sufficiently intelligent or nerdy 12-year-old can do so immediately. Right? I don't know who the youngest person is to write a smart contract that does something interesting, but I bet they're under 15. And if one of those smart contracts becomes as popular and as widely used as Facebook, you could wind up with these kind of nerd Reich emperors at 12 years old <laughs> defining reality for hundreds of thousands of people's daily livelihoods. Mm -hmm. And this all sounds really funny until it happens. <laughs> right? Then what do you do? So I want to basically stress that I don't think that this is an absolute challenge to our ability to govern or our ability to make policy. I don't think that these things are threats to the fundamental social contracts inside of our societies, because I don't think we'll let them become threats. In the societies of the strong social contract where everybody agrees on what the rules of the game are, I think that these technologies will be smoothly integrated and they'll strengthen the existing social contracts. So in Switzerland it will be privacy, here it will be effective sharing, collectivization. Uh, in America, where you have a badly broken social contract, it might cause even more friction and it might even trigger collapse conditions in some areas. If the American government winds up fighting a war against cryptography against its own people, they could easily lose Silicon Valley because they basically pick up and all move to Brazil. And the impact on the American economy could be absolutely catastrophic if they wind up making war on their own economic engines. It would have been as, as absurd as attempting to ban cars in the 1920s because they wanted to keep lots of people employed to drive horses. <laughs> but that's the kind of thinking that comes when the president basically says, hey, these amazing new technologies are really threatening us. No, they're giving you opportunities which are too scared or, un or unsophisticated technically to grasp. Uh, and I think that that is about what I had to say. Thank you.